I call the meeting of the House Environment and Natural Resources Finance Division to order. Uh, members, if they could uh, take their seats. And I do note that we do have a quorum. Uh, Representative Lee, do you move the minutes for January 15th? Mr. Chair, move the minutes for January 15th. Thank you, Representative Lee. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Minutes are adopted. Congratulations on another successful motion, Representative. <laughs> uh, today we have with us uh, the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, the Minnesota Zoo is one of uh, the accounts uh, as a state agency in the purview of this division. And uh, we have uh, Representative John Hewitt here, uh, who represents the area that includes the zoo, uh, to introduce the Minnesota Zoo. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I want to just take a little time here because I was trained in as a freshman. I'm not presenting a bill today, but I did bring the treat. So I know the rules, okay? <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to the Environmental Finance Committee and introducing one of the state's greatest assets, the Minnesota Zoo. Our zoo is located in Apple Valley, just 20 minutes from the Capitol. I am so proud to say our zoo is located in my home district. Our Minnesota Zoo is not just a static display. With the outreach programs, it reaches every corner of our great state. I encourage you to look through the report in front of you our Minnesota Zoo's mission is to connect people, animals, the natural world, and save wildlife, which they do through environmental education, unique experience, unique, I'm sorry, unique experiences, and conservation science. Today we will give you a taste of, a, of our Minnesota Zoo, and I have with me John Raleigh, Raleigh. <laughs> director of the Minnesota Zoo. Chris, an interpretive naturalist with the Zoomobile program, and Dr. Eric Rehnquist, who will, be, who will talk to you about the zoo's conservation program and how his team has been working to conserve Minnesota's prairie butterflies. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hewitt. And you, you mentioned a taste of the zoo, but you did provide a, a taste of animal crackers. That's, that's your gift to us today. I went at 6 a.m. this morning to Cub and bought every animal cracker box they had. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mr. Frawley, Director Frawley, would you like to uh, begin? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for having us here. It's always a privilege uh, to come present the, the great mission and the great work of the Minnesota Zoo. Um, the fun part of the presentation today is behind me uh, with Chris and the animals and Eric talking about our field conservation, which is world known. The Minnesota Zoo is a leader in conservation amongst zoos worldwide. Um, so, but I, do, I did think it's important to just take a little bit of time and brief you a little bit on, on Zoo 101, your Minnesota Zoo, the state's Minnesota Zoo, um, and just remind you of some of the statistics that support the great work that uh, our team um, achieves. So our mission is connecting people and animals to the natural world to save wildlife. Um, a lot of people don't realize the Minnesota Zoo is the fifth largest zoo in the country. With over 500 acres, we have a world-class zoo. Um, I sit on the board of directors for World Association of Zoos, and worldwide, people recognize and are impressed with the Minnesota Zoo on all fronts. Um, the zoo also should be known is 40 years old this year. So your new zoo that a lot of people re refer to the new zoo, 40 years old. So we are talking a lot about infrastructure and keeping it relevant and keeping it new. Uh, we're the largest environmental education center in the state of Minnesota. We work at a large scale. We reach a lot of, a lot of people with over 400,000 people reached with environmental education every year. Over 1.3 million visitors a year come to the Minnesota Zoo. We have over 500 species of animals with over 5,000 specimens. And uniquely, over 70 animals at the Minnesota Zoo are threatened or endangered. Uh, so that's an amazing uh, number at the zoo. We also are the state's pollinator bank. Our governance of the Minnesota Zoo, we are governed. We do have a state board of directors. Uh, 15 of those board members are appointed by the governor. Uh, 15 are appointed by the board. We also have a 30 member uh, found Minnesota Zoo Foundation Board to help philanthropically support the zoo. Um, so together, they work together as a 60 member board of trustees. 
a little bit of a snapshot on 18 financials, so I was asked to do that. The zoo is a, just a little over a $28 million budget. Um, probably the easiest, and this, this shows you how, the, how our budget breaks down on the revenue side, and I have an expense slide as well. Probably the easiest way to explain this is one-third of our funding for the most part, about approximately one-third comes from the state. Two-thirds of our funding, we have to roll up our sleeves and we have to earn it and we have to raise that money through our gate and working with our foundation to raise that money. So I think it's a smart business model. Um, it allows that kind of a business model working with the state, but also two-thirds of you know, working hard ourselves allows us to be a world-class zoo. Our expense side um, is outlined here. Uh, 18 overall, as you can see by the numbers um, from the two, um, we're doing well, we're meeting all of our budget projections at the Minnesota Zoo. Who works at the zoo? Um, a lot of people don't realize the zoo is like a small city. Like I said, it's the fifth largest <coughs> in the country. We have over 350 jobs uh, at the zoo, employees at the zoo. We have over 1,200 volunteers working at the Minnesota Zoo. Uh, that's equal to almost 58 full-time employees. And on top of that, we have a lot of zoo teens and um, interns throughout the zoo, over 60 internships a year. Um, our employees are represented by MAPE, Ask Me, and MMA. Community programs, we are a state zoo. We pride ourselves in reaching the entire state. You're gonna get a taste of that today with our Zoomobile programs. Um, we host over 100,000 school kids at the Minnesota Zoo every year from over 1,000 Minnesota schools. Uh, we've, we host foreign language days, Spanish, French, German, our foreign language days are, have a steady growth this year. I think some of those days saw two to 3,000 students a day. Um, we also have one of, the, one of the best and largest STEM programs at the zoo. We call it Zoo, uh, where we address science, technology, engineering, and math at the zoo. And, and uh, students and teachers participate from around the entire state. We do over almost 6,000 uh, camp uh, attendees every year at the Minnesota Zoo. Bird shows daily, close encounters daily. All of this happens every day, all year long at the Minnesota Zoo. So a lot of reach to community and education programs. Oops. A little bit of a, you know, a lot of people ask me, I'm, I'm three years old in my job at the, as the director of the Minnesota Zoo. So we've been doing a lot of strategic planning for the zoo. What's the future of the zoo? Uh, we're master planning right now, and I can give you a little snapshot. It's best summarized by three words, revitalize, mobilize, and naturalize. Number one, revitalize, we're a 40-year-old zoo. We need to keep the zoo relevant for the next 40 years. The biggest threat to the Minnesota Zoo is getting, if we get old, if we let the facility get old, and we get too much deferred maintenance or asset preservation. You see that in zoos around the country where they just build new exhibit after new exhibit, and they're not taking care of the old exhibits. My theory is we don't need blockbuster exhibits. You know, people love the Minnesota Zoo. What we need is to make sure we keep it relevant and keep it fixed up. That's our job. So n nothing fancy. You're not going to see big blockbuster exhibits. We need to revitalize the old 40-year-old zoo. Um, mobilize the zoo. We, talked, we use the word mobilize. The zoo used to have a monorail. A lot of you maybe rode the monorail. That stopped running until 2013. Uh, the good news on the monorail track, we have a project we're proposing, which is to convert it to a walking tour trail through the treetops of Minnesota, called the Minnesota Treetop Trail. You'll be seeing me bringing that to you a, a lot in the year ahead. It's a very exciting project. But back to mobilizing, we are a big zoo. We need to help people with special needs. We need to help the older adults, older Minnesotans, be able to migrate and get around the zoo, get in the zoo and get easily migrate the zoo. So we're looking at transportation and shuttles and hop on hop off support within the zoo. Lastly, and kind of exciting, um, you know, the average kid in our country is behind technology 10 hours a day and outside less than one. The average 19 year old in our country is dormant in the given day, the same as a 60 year old. So as much as we all love technology, it's having an impact. The Minnesota Zoo is a 500 acre zoo. Our new strategic plan is to use that 500 acres to create one of the biggest base camps for nature in the country, uh, working with our environmental colleagues throughout the state. We think we can be a gateway to nature. We're looking at bringing in cabins and tent sites, rope courses, zip lines, hiking trails, 
mountain climbing, you know, really bringing in some new ideas and new products to the zoo that can help reconnect and get people excited about getting back into nature and getting off their cell phones. We think we can be a gateway to the state park system, to the regional park systems, to the outward bounds, work, you know, YMCAs. Uh, so we're excited. That's something you're going to be hearing more about from the Minnesota Zoo uh, in the year ahead from, from me. Uh, we're super excited about naturalizing the zoo. Lastly, and then we'll, I'll let the animals take over. One of the first things I, when I got to the zoo, I heard a lot, people would say, you know, the Como Zoo is free, John. You know, you guys have, you charge. And I love the Como Zoo, that was my first zoo. And I became a zoo director, so I gotta give them credit because that was my first zoo too. But it's, the key to that statement is, it's about being free to Minnesotans who need you to be free. And that's the most important part. So we looked at that, and the zoo used to do free, free days, and we used to do free passes for agencies. And if you think about it, that's a little bit, um, um, it's, it's you know, not fair to have somebody to have to come on a Wednesday. You know, it's a little discriminative. So we said, you know, the state of Minnesota already does a good job identifying assistance to Minnesotans through general assistance programs and WIC and SNAP and others. So what we did when I got here is we changed our access programs to if you qualify for assistance in Minnesota, you now come to the Minnesota Zoo for free. And the great thing we did is we made it very simple at the front gate. They just show their card, show an ID, and we let them and their family come in for free. And it's really changed the game for access at the Minnesota Zoo. This year, since, or, since we've changed it, uh, we're on track to do over 100,000 Minnesotans for free this year at the Minnesota Zoo. It's the number one phone call we're getting at the Minnesota Zoo. Is it true I can bring my whole family for free? You know, we're going to be working. You're going to hear me on the radio. You're going to hear me throughout the state really promoting our free to explore program to make sure people know they can come to the Minnesota Zoo for free. And then after that, we're going to be going after two times poverty. And we need to work for the, the minimum wage families and make sure they have days to get to the zoo. So we're working with corporate Minnesota and we're saying to corporate Minnesota, underwrite a day every month we, so that you know we can bring more Minnesotans in for free. Dakota Electric stepped up. They underwrote a day. Um, to show your Dakota Electric bill, 9,000 people came that day. Wings Financial did it. And if we have one corporate day a, a month, Minnesotans can find that are two times poverty can find a way to get to the zoo for free as well. So we're excited about that. Stay tuned. We're gonna, you're going to hear more about the access part of the Minnesota Zoo. So with that, um, I'd like to just step aside. And uh, I think we're going to go with Zoomobile first. So Chris is going to step up. I'm going to come back at the end and ask, answer any questions you may have. But I'd love to introduce you to one of the most exciting programs in the state of Minnesota, it reaches the entire state of Minnesota, and that's our Zoomobile program. I'm gonna walk right out the middle. Yeah. With somebody who's just excited to come on out. Um, so, or the Rainier bus. So those of you guys that aren't familiar with Zoomobile, we are a staff of seven people that um, take care of about 80 animals. Last year, we roughly went to about 43 counties in the state. We did just about 600 hours of programming, and that's not counting stuff like this, TV, on-site stuff. Um, and we saw just shy of 60,000 people. That's us going to them. And so we're a busy group of people. And I have for you today three of our very hard animal ambassadors. And our very first one is one of our favorites. Um, he's actually from well, he's from Minnesota. He's from Duluth. His name is Ross. He's going to walk around on the floor a little bit. You guys are going to feel what it's like to be third grader and have a friend visit your class. <laughs> Come on, Ross. <laughs> so, all right, kids, what is he? Speak up. Oh, is it pork pork? He's a pork. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ross is a North American pork client. He came to us. Um, from right around Duluth. Are you done? <laughs> done. Uh -huh. He came to us from right around Duluth. He was an orphan when he was found. Um, he was maybe not even a day old. His umbilical cord was still attached. So he was a tiny, tiny little thing. Hi. That's a good one. I'll tell you what. He was about, hmm? like, can of help. Tiny, tiny, tiny. <laughs> Do you want any? 
So when we travel the state, the, the thing with Minnesota is we're a big state. North to South, we're a very big state. And so, where are you going? So kids in the northern part of the state see this animal and say, so? Kids in the southern part of the state say, that doesn't live here. And so we're able to, <laughs> he's going to go help himself out we are able to bring Minnesota animals to parts of the state that uh, don't normally. So we're able to bring animals to different parts of the state where other kids would just get to see them. We'll turn two. I, I don't think okay. I close on her head or anything like that. Like that? Worry about. Yeah. Um, he's a little stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> Any two year old, right? Um, he's like, I'm going right back over here. I want to talk to this lady. Like, let's talk about four cunning issues. <laughs> um, and he might smell, yeah. If you have a dog at home, he might be smelling that. That's the attraction. Now, since he likes you, do you want to try and pet him? Sure. <laughs> So here's the thing. He does have all his quills. So you're going to have to go from his head to his tail. Okay. Are you going to go from the right tail? Are the quills venomous? No. I mean, there might be something in there that you would have to the other one. Is that possible? Is anybody else? No. I want to try. I pulled them out of my dog's nose. There is a safe way to get some help. They're quills, that kid. Does anybody else want to try? When they get it in the yeah. Head tail. What you do Front is you back. clip the quill and that releases the pressure on that hook. So when you take them out of the dog. He's a good 14 shot. Snip them first. Oh, and what big feet. Big feet. Oh. <laughs> That's a big guy. So if you can imagine being, you know, a kid and this comes to your classroom, that's pretty cool. We're going to put this through this. <laughs> is that the biggest he would get? He's huge. That's about the biggest <laughs> he is a lot bigger than us. Um, but is that his biggest? Yes, he's as big as he's going to get. You're just a little Indian monster shape. <laughs> 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 and then they say, you know, when you work with animals, you have to be patient. Research, research hallway crud. Say that shit tastes like chicken. Should I do it? Should I do it? I just, that's up to you. Well, Left hand. Little. Very careful there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Little. He would, um. You quit telling that to me, Joe. So this was bigger than he was with that. And we wrestled. And as you might be able to see, I, we accidentally pulled a chair over there, but he does have all the quills. <laughs> <laughs> they are sharp. They do. So. so that's one cute thing. largest Minnesota species. A lot of people are very unhappy to find out that we have snakes this big that live in Minnesota. So if any of you guys are from Albert Lee, 
down around Wells or Winnebago. That's where these guys are. And so kids, you see this amazing thing. How many of you guys don't like snakes? <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of snakes. This is a co-worker's. A little bit different. Um, but these guys in the state of Minnesota, so if we're, if we're using them for a small group of kids, we just talk about snakes in general. But this is also one of our species in Minnesota. When Eric comes up and talks about butterflies, this is also <coughs> one of our kind of watch animals here in the state of Minnesota. They have a pretty special ecosystem that they live in, and so not only do we get to talk about cool snake stuff, now we can talk about farming, or we can talk about habitat protection, all that stuff as we get older and older and older in the schools. This guy is named Ringo. Ringo and Goldie are our two cool snakes. And he is about six years old. How, how old was he? Our oldest one that we've ever had, I think, got to be about 15 or 16 years old. What do they eat? Gophers. Oh. Anything small plus a gopher. So you guys think about how big a gopher is. That's a pretty good size. That's a pretty good size. So what we tell the kids is, you think I'm afraid of them. Imagine, <laughs> imagine having, you know, a watermelon fruit. If you could eat like a snake, you could swallow that watermelon with one bowl. Juice. And so, and that's usually what I've seen backwards. Feed it! <laughs> <laughs> we can't feed it in front of everybody, but um, they are incredible. And now he's going to be great. Wants the time. Everyone's like, yes. <laughs> we'll do some, some touching. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys, you're all grown ups. Make sure you wash your hands. <laughs> Make sure you don't put your fingers in your mouth. <laughs> or around this way. And I apologize to the. Vacuum staff that have to clean up after dogs. That's <laughs> you guys did great. A lot of people think snakes are slimy. Frogs are slimy. Snakes are like basketballs. And if there's somebody who really doesn't want me to walk over there, just let me know. <laughs> well, it's a good question. Do they bite? Do you guys want to know the biggest zookeeper rule we tell everybody? Don't bite it. If it has a mouth, it can bite you. We get these guys when they're about the size of pencils. We work really, really hard to make sure that they're, you know, good at this. Not every animal becomes an education animal. There are some that just aren't going to do it. And that's, that's fair. I can go behind you. That'll work. Peter? I don't know. Do these people want me to go behind you? Hi, behind you. <clears throat> so when we go to a school, it's going to be everywhere from, like yesterday, I was with two, <coughs> two and three-year-olds at a daycare. We go places like here. I've done programs at Ikea. That was weird, but it was fun. You good? Oh my God. If I switch with you, it's going to like this. <laughs> um, and everything from, you know, five kids Brad, to, to 300 kids. We usually bring about five animals. I don't know if he's going to let go of my hand. but And we usually spend about 40... Possibly. I know my hands are pretty warm right now. He's probably pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know where that snake is. <laughs> <laughs> just took her, his tongue on it again. I saw that. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then somebody, you know, do snakes have personalities? Yep. You know, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Too much time in the world. And my last friend? <laughs> also, no, I'll go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> this one is sometimes a harder sell, right? But even though it's not the cute, fuzzy, oh my gosh, I want that. Sweet, like we tell kids, still important part of the part of the state, still important part of the ecosystem. Okay? Sometimes they really have trouble with some of the bugs. Right? Bugs. You say to kids, what does a bug exoskeleton sound like? And they all go, how do you know that? Like, Step on them. Huh? Yeah. You want to get past the stepping on the bug part? They eat over and not bad. I know. 
come up here. Who's it selling that beef? Yeah. 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 One more. Not Minnesota. Get a few of them. Super cute. Oh. 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 It's the anti venom. <laughs> no, that's right. That's the sound. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> Says, oh, I want to learn more. So what is it, folks? Chinchilla. 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 Now, two people. Why do you have a chinchilla, right? Well, we know them as the pets. This is also one of the most endangered mammals on Earth. Wild chinchillas, two to 3,000 left in the world. This becomes one of the really weird animals where we have a ton of them as pets. Very few in the wild. Hmm. And one of the cool things we get to do um, at the zoo through the foundation is we get to work with different species around the world. And for the past nine years, I've been working with an organization called Save the Wild Chinchillas, which is, you know, you're walking the walk, you're doing the talk, right? And why would you not want to save these guys? <laughs> <laughs> So this is Nimbus. Nimbus is about two and a half years old. Is he smelling? Is that why that whiskers? Well, he's a rodent. Really super cute mouse, right? Okay. Lots of sniffing, lots of figuring out what's going on out there. Right? Yep. We'll go around this way. About 60 hairs in each follicle. Super soft. They live way up in the Andes Mountains where it's very, very cold. 23 degrees didn't feel so bad for him. <laughs> nice whiskers. Big whiskers. If the whiskers fit, in theory, the chinchilla fits. Kind of like our some of our other pets that we have. They hop like kangaroos. They're super fast. They're made to hop up and down the sides of mountains. Oops, there goes my. So this next summer at the zoo, we're going to have some South American exhibits going on. The chinchillas can't be on exhibit because of their love for cold weather in Minnesota summer. Not a good mix. But we are going to talk about the chinchilla story. So when John was talking about conservation, we do conservation around the world and Minnesota. And so this is a better than the sink? Yeah, well. Yeah, better than the sink. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that little face. So you guys all have those good feelings, right? Something pretty fun cool. came to work today. The kids get that too. It'd be a pretty cool though. And we get really fun letters from all the kids like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I got to pet a whatever. They've been from over. They've been. I bet you get some interesting <laughs> We get interesting spellings of things. Yeah. <laughs> some phonetically weird spelled. I'm just so soft. I just got, I went down to the store and I was softer than a pipe. <laughs> 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 That's where they <laughs> Soft and red. Oh, okay. Good. She's, yeah. I touch it. You're going to put some Yes, <laughs> Benick told me that no Calgon loves to hide trout fish, so he might be willing to take you to, to show you the rocks. Uh, All made a Nina, little connection, right? Nina owns a Remax in the water. And they've owned one or two different resorts in the Great Lake area off of the south. But he's a good guy. And sometimes a pain in the nuts. Real quick in a nutshell, real quick in a nutshell of three of our animals, two well behaved, one named Ross. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, kind of what we do and where we go and you, those good feelings that's what you got to remember right animals, kids, good feelings and traveling to those schools you know Browns Valley been out there really? yeah a couple of years ago yeah we would do like Morris 
Cyrus, Browns Valley, on that way. Yeah. And then we have War Road, Baudette, International Falls every other year, I think. And so we've been to Marshall. We do a lot of Marshall. And then down towards Winona. So we go everywhere. So 20 minutes here. <laughs> Shortest trip of the week. <coughs> well, do they travel? Some travel better than others. Mr. Ross has about a four hour window. So he's not doing an overnight trip to Brown Valley. <laughs> Chinchillas, they do great. Um, and so we, we have really, you know, when we do a hotel stay over, how do you feel about pets? Okay, let's talk about that. Because <laughs> um, there might be turtles in the bathtub, there might be a chinchilla hopping around in a playpen. You know, these guys, they can't stay in their crates all night long, so they need some exercise too. Um, so we, we have a group, it's a smaller group, but a group that can handle the traveling and, and all the stresses of traveling. And it's like traveling with toddlers. <laughs> they all have, you know, their food and their blankie and their stuff and their toys and that good stuff. So they work hard. We try to make sure they're happy. All right. You guys have any other questions? How old is that? Nimbus is, uh, she just turned two. How old will they? Normal age, they would be somewhere around eight to ten. We had one down at the zoo. Her name was Emma. She would be 19 years old. So, yeah. Yeah. the first. There's another one. I'll see one more. Hold on. Oh, 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 oh. Got it? I didn't do it on purpose, I promise. <laughs> Mr. Thank Chair. you, uh, Mr. Frawley. Yep, Mr. Chair, committee members, um, as you can see, a passionate staff with the great, great animals that go throughout the state. At this time, I'd, I'd like to invite one of our uh, conservation biologist, uh, Eric Runquist, up. He's going to give you an overview of some of our conservation projects focusing on pollinators. Thank you. Dr. Runquist. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. I'm Dr. Eric Runquist. I'm one of seven conservation biologists at the Minnesota Zoo. We really are a conservation-centric state agency. It is really at the heart of, of everything we do through those connections with nature. Um, as part of our mission as the as Minnesota Zoo to connect people, animals, and the natural world. I really want to emphasize that last part here of us as a conservation agency working on and, and doing a lot of actions on the ground. We have conservation programs all around the world. Uh, in Minnesota, we have, or we have primarily three programs at the moment, uh, through re uh, actually four, uh, reintroductions of bison in partnership with Minnesota State Parks, um, and uh, a new freshwater conservation program for mussels, freshwater native mussels, most of which have now disappeared from the state or are dramatically endangered, but, but are in dire need of, of extra help, uh, also in partnership with Minnesota DNR and others. And we also have a new freshwater turtle program going on, and we can talk more about those. I don't have enough time here to talk about all of those. I also do want to highlight, though, the, the goal of any conservation biologist's job is to put themselves out of a job. And that's, so that's my goal long term in our butterfly program that I'll talk about. But one thing I do want to highlight is, is the successes we have had in the past as well. If you see a swan, a trumpeter swan, flying around the state of Minnesota anywhere, that is thanks to the successful conservation program managed by the Minnesota Zoo and Minnesota DNR and others, reintroducing uh, this once extinct species in the state. And that we now have sustainable populations of swans throughout the state of Minnesota. They've been removed from our endangered species list. Um, and so that is our long-term goal here. I'm going to be focusing on prairies and the, the organisms that really are inhabiting it. Um, you've, you've seen a lot of the, the cute fuzzies here, and uh, certainly the, the prairies are, are, are home to some really iconic wildlife in the state, such as bison and bobolinks, um, pheasants, etc. cetera. Uh, and those are the charismatic megafauna. I want to talk about the microfauna, the charismatic microfauna of the world, particularly the prairie butterflies. Butterflies have value. Um, so 
they are certainly a, they have a strong aesthetic value to them. They're, they're, many of them are, are quite beautiful, and this is this is really a, a gateway. There's a tremendous diversity of butterfly life out there, and they are a tremendous gateway to contact with nature, and that's something we do want to emphasize here. I owe my interest in butterflies and my interest in as a scientist in ecology and entomology and, and biology thanks to butterflies. And, and that was fostered at a very young age when I was about the age of the children in this photo here who were who came out and, and observed some of our on the ground butterfly conservation programs that I'll talk about in a little bit. And so that gateway and connections to the larger environment is one of those things we want to really want to foster. Butterflies certainly garner a lot of attention, such as at the Minneapolis Monarch Festival here, where the Minnesota Zoo has hosted a booth for the last several years. Um, thousands of thousands of people attend this festival every year. It is quite a terrific event, all in the name of monarchs and cultural heritage. You can even get butterfly paparazzis or, or you know, coming around and, and trying to photograph that rare butterfly as we were uh, reintroducing some of our butterflies here. Again, there's a very strong public interest in the welfare of butterflies. What I do want to highlight, though, particularly are butterflies and their value as, as scientific organis organisms. So, for example, we know the monarch migration uh, from Minnesota down to Mexico and back. We know they, they came from Minnesota because a monarch tagged at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum was then found in Mexico. This was how we proved monarchs in Mexico came from here in the first place. And there's tremendous citizen science around butterflies that has provided a tremendous amount of information. Butterflies are tremendously good indicators of ecological health. And it's very easy for them to, uh, to be disrupted. We can use them as, as sort of sentinels or prairies uh, or canaries of the prairie in many ways. The butterfly here on your right is the Dakota skipper. I'll be talking a lot more about this here. Butterflies are very important pollinators and they are also very important members of their e greater ecosystem. Like it or not, as a butterfly biologist, butterflies are very good food for vertebrates. So there are a lot of birds, so 80 to 90% of a bird's diet, uh, for example, like chickadees, they are eating the caterpillars of butterflies. And so without these small organisms, we really will lose larger species at the same time. So the Dakota skipper, this is a US threatened species and a Minnesota endangered butterfly. Um, we used to have quite a wide range of them. Um, historically, the, the range here is in white, uh, overlaid over the, the map. We had uh, about half of the world's population, maybe a little less, but um, you'll notice those little red dots. And, and if it's hard to see the dots on the map, that's partly because uh, we do not know about where much of the range. We can infer that they were across this entire range from Saskatchewan to Chicago historically. In Minnesota, though, we probably only have one viable remaining population left. We used to have hundreds that we know about. So at least three-fourths of the global population is gone, gone in the southern portion of the range, and maybe in, in Minnesota, one, maybe two population remaining. The Powashik skipperling. This is the most endangered animal in butterfly, or uh, uh, most endangered animal in Minnesota, probably, um, and across the upper Midwest. It's U.S. endangered, Minnesota endangered, gone from 99% of its historical locations. All of these states is likely extinct at, including now Minnesota, unfortunately. This is the most Minnesotan butterfly in the world. We had half of the historic range of the butterfly. Um, but now only hundreds are left. And if you're having trouble finding where the last remaining populations of the butterfly are, I'm going to highlight them there for you in those little blue circles. There's a population just north of the Minnesota border in, Winnip in Manitoba a very questionable population in central Wisconsin, and a very small sliver in uh, eastern Michigan that we've been working with. So this was one of the most uh, common butterflies on our prairies historically. It was predictably boring. It was one of those you were not necessarily going to be riding down in, when you went out and were looking for butterflies. It was not something you were actively seeking, and, and then it fell off the face of the earth about two decades ago, and even a decade ago. So this now is much rarer than a panda. There's probably three to four more giant pandas in the world, uh, time more, times more pandas in the world than there are power sheik skipperlings. These are our pandas. Um, in terms of endangeredness, they're mo now most comparable to bison about 100 years ago. 
when we had nearly wiped them off the face of the earth through, uh, over, with overhunting. The question is, we've been able to bring bison back to a fairly sustainable level. Um, can we do the same with Pauchik skipperlings and many of the other species? And this is not just a story about these two endangered butterflies. There are actually 15 species of butterflies in, this, uh, in the state of Minnesota that are state listed as endangered, threatened, or of special concern. And 10 of these are actually prairie dependent. So two thirds of the butterflies and the most trouble in the state are dependent on our prairies. And unfortunately, eight of our 15 species are now probably out already extinct in Minnesota. So this is a real loss of a system that we're talking about here. And butterflies are sentinels. They are uh, important for knowing what's all going on in the greater ecosystem. And if we've lost this many species, what else is, has been disappearing that we have less of an ear to the ground for? So why did they disappear? Well, certainly in, in, in context for these butter, these prairie butterflies, it's the loss of the prairie itself. Once covered a third of the state and now um, really is only in tiny little fragments. So instead of these vast oceans of grasslands that stretched on for a thousand miles north and south um, from Canada to Texas, we really now have to think about each remaining prairie is a tiny little fragment left. We have about barely 1% of our prairie remaining in the state of Minnesota. This is the most endangered ecosystem in North America. Most people might think of, uh, you know, what's an endangered ecosystem? They might think of the rainforests or coral reefs, and those are definitely in trouble. But in terms of proportionate loss, this is a near extinction of this entire ecosystem. So that certainly hasn't helped these butterflies that are not likely to be moving very far historically. Um, within each of those prairies though, some of those prairies still look pretty good, maybe a thousand acres here or there, separated by 15 miles of non-suitable habitat. So then we need to think about individual problems at individual prairies as potential explanations for what those are going on and those could be interacting in varying and complex ways. I can talk a whole lot more about that here. I don't have time today, but I'm happy to speak with you more. So the Minnesota Zoo established the Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program in 2012 in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DNR and uh, the Nature Conservancy and many or or other organizations and saying, how can we as a conservation-centric organization, especially one that, f that specializes in breeding and rearing and uh, endangered species, how can we best contribute to facilitate conservation of, of species in the state of Minnesota. And this was really made possible initially by legacy funding. Uh, so the butterfly conservation program was, was selected of, from those uh, as, as the first tackling, uh, for, as the first program to really start tackling these things. And we now have grown our program into three up to, and up to five seasonal staff uh, year round. Um, and we are now rearing, breeding, and now reintroducing butterflies back into the state of Minnesota. We've been very successful at this. And indeed, the Minnesota Zoo has been now classified as a state pollinator bank. We are one of the agencies that is serving as the pollinator bank. This is uh, this modified the definition of the statute uh, defining the Minnesota Zoo as an organization that specializes in the rearing, the breeding, and the conservation of endangered pollinators in the state of Minnesota and establishing these insurance populations. We now have about 800 Dakota skippers at the Minnesota Zoo right now. They're happily sleeping the winter away as caterpillars. Um, and we are hoping to then expand that uh, continually. We've been growing every year. The real goal though is not to just have species at the zoo in an insurance setting. We want to be then contributing back out into the wild. We want to reintroduce them. We want to get them back where they were in the first place. That's really what's gonna be needed for the stability of these species in the long term and to get them off of the endangered species list. So we've now begun reintroductions of Dakota skippers now two years ago. Here is, uh, so we would bring them back out into the uh, prairie as, as the pupa, let them go daily as adults, transferring them onto their, their beautiful nectar flowers that they depend upon and letting them do their thing. And this is a little bit unnerving it's been like letting our sending our kids off to college you know we hope they can make something good of themselves and you know start a good new future again but it's been very exciting for each of the last two years we've released about 200 dakota skippers at a nature conservancy preserve in southwest minnesota uh, near lake benton and part of our operation is not just to let them go we want to know about successes of them so we have a, a zoo staff member on the ground for at least 
about five weeks, consecutive weeks, uh, through the end of June and middle of July. So, uh, censusing butterflies that we've released, looking for them again, trying to uh, evaluate success and look at how they're moving and utilizing the landscape. And we've been, each year, been seeing a couple hundred individuals on this prairie again. So we're, we're happy and this, uh, this is going to be continuing for a few, several more years. We can also happily report that we are now seeing breeding behavior of Dakota skippers back out in the wild in southwest Minnesota in at least a decade um, through, our, our, through our efforts through those zoo-released animals, which is fabulous. Our long-term goals for the program are to continue the reintroduction, but really we want to then uh, work on uh, expanding that into larger areas. So we have a new a recommended recommendation from the LCCMR for new funding. <coughs> through the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. This will uh, work on an enhancing prairie at Glacial Lake State Park, including the addition of floral resources that we think may be a limiting factor. It's one of our leading hypotheses here, and we have uh, very explicit experiments laid out to try to test this. Uh, we will then be expanding and adding reintroductions to the park, and then tracking the way those butterflies interact with the habitat, with those uh, experimental manipulations, and then out of that, try to understand what is needed for them uh, long-term recovery and to develop a management toolkit so that we'll have very broad applications and, and how we can improve our prairies, improve, improve the future of these species. And that goes beyond just the health of these species and the prairies. These have very long-term uh, economic benefits as well for, say, water quality and the way we manage our prairies and using them as filtration sources. For power sheik skippling, we've also been very happily uh, advancing along here. Again, this is a much more endangered animal in the world. We've got about 16 at the zoo right now, and for the first time last year in history of the world, we began reintroducing power sheik skipperlings back out into one of the locations in Michigan where they came from in the first place. So the idea for, the, for this program is to let's sustain the populations that, we, that are on the edge of extinction. We're not right now going to try to get populations back. We just need to stop the bleeding on these last populations in the world. There, again, there's probably only a couple hundred individuals globally remaining of this once very common butterfly. The idea is let's stop the bleeding, let's figure out what we need to stabilize them, and then we can think about broader reintroductions. This has been now an expanding international partnership. The Cinnaboyne Park Zoo in Winnipeg, Manitoba has partnered with us, and they are also now launching parallel programs and have begun re reintroductions and releases of Pauchik Sierpillings in Manitoba. This really is now, like, as I said, it's an international partnership. We work with state, federal, um, <coughs> international, and nonprofit organizations of a wide variety of, of backgrounds and perspectives. And I'm very proud of the growth that our program has had in the last seven years. Uh, the bulk of our funding for the program has historically been legacy, and now especially the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. We do get uh, grants from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, as as much as we can from other sources as well, such as Disney or Association of Zoos and Aquariums. I, would, I want to bring it home back though. This is all fine and we want to, you know, this, uh, thinking about these small species, the zoo really takes its, its message and its action need very seriously. We want to think about the, the health and status of our pollinators statewide, not just these butterflies that I bet you probably hadn't heard of before now. Uh, this beautiful bee, the beautiful native bee on this beautiful flower occurred right here in my backyard in the Twin Cities. We have jewels in our backyards and it's up to us to, to one, take the time to stop and notice them and two, to take care of them and encourage these sorts of opportunities in our backyards. We are dramatically losing pollinators statewide and worldwide and we want to emphasize simple actions that can be taken. The Minnesota Zoo, very seriously takes its, its mission of responsible stewardship of those resources that are entrusted to us. And this is not only the financial side and the logistical side, but it's also the environmental side. So on zoo grounds, for example, we've replaced some of our somewhat static uh, eastern parking lot grassy berms and put in example prairies and wildflower gardens for um, not only engagement with zoo guests who education, ed, educate, say, metro residents that have not had any experience with, with prairies before and this endangered ecosystem, but then also the, the contact points that uh, we can demonstrate actions and planting for, how planting for native pollinators can really do a whole lot for us. Another example of that would be uh, rain gardens at the zoo. These are a little newer, um, not only benefiting pollinators, but then also benefiting our 
uh, water quality in the cities and, and across the state, how native plants have really strong benefits in those ways. Now, uh, just so happens, can anybody identify this photo? This, on, sitting on this little flower was this little bee. Can anybody identify it? Bee balm. It's bee balm is the plant, correct? Rusty patch. This is the rusty patch bumblebee, very good. So the rusty patch bumblebee is, is now one of the most endangered species on earth as well. But coincidentally, the Twin Cities are one of the real strongholds for this Great Lakes species. It has de declined at least 90% in the last decade for largely unknown reasons. We have the ability in the Twin Cities and across the state to really have a dramatically Im impactful uh, help for this butterfly, or for, for, this, for this bumblebee. Uh, these habitats where we, are, we have now found dozens of rusty patch bumblebees on zoo grounds, they were not there 10 years ago. We created habitat and this endangered species is now taking advantage of it and, and being very, um, apparently very happy. So responsible stewardship is a big piece of this. And here's one, for example, here's a rusty patch bumblebee right in front of the eastern entrance of the, for the zoo. So this is an action that everybody can take. We can do these small steps. We want to show uh, actions for wildlife. And I encourage you f uh, through those pamphlets that we handed out to plant for pollinators as well. These were produced with Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund uh, as well. And we have thousands more copies of those if any members of the committee are interested in more. Finally, I'll end with that lo loss of connection to nature. We need to engage to inspire. We need to foster those connections to nature. Those can happen at the small scale, at the medium scale, at the individual level. These are very important. We are dramatically losing knowledge and history and, and experience with nature. And that is one of the <coughs> most important ways, if not the most powerful way, that we can really be in uh, creating long-term conservation ethos. With that, I'll thank the committee and be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Rehnquist. Any questions? <laughs> Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I just, uh, Dr. Rehnquist, I didn't want you to feel bad when the media left when you started talking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand the, uh, the relative value of, of charismatic <laughs> megafauna. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Wagenius. <clears throat> well, we need to have some conversations about um, how far we should keep, uh, or how big an area do you need to do a reintroduction without having some of the things that kill bees and butterflies uh, drift onto your land? What, what kind of acreage are you talking about? Can't hear. Chair, members of the committee and representative. Uh, so yes, as part of our, our reintroduction goals, uh, we are, we've evaluated many of those kinds of questions of, of what constitutes good habitat for these butterflies. Certainly it does not help anything if we are putting butterflies out into the environment and those populations can't sustain themselves or if there are strong external stressors that we are not thinking about or even internal stressors. So uh, one of the areas we've been studying over the last several years is say, uh, the effective adjacent operations to them, including insecticide drift. We've now been documenting um, in a rather foundational way insecticides inside of prairies that are designated as critical habitat for these butterflies. And this isn't necessarily to point fingers at anybody right now, um, or because we think that those applications are, are probably being done in exactly the way that's on the back of the label, but we are still finding insecticides inside prairies. The real risk, though, is, is what is the actual level of, that's the real question, what is the actual level of risk? If we're finding 15 parts per billion of a particular insecticide a mile inside of a protected prairie, what does that mean for a little caterpillar on the ground feeding on those prairie grasses? We are partnering with the University of Minnesota on some uh, research to try to understand that using common non, uh, uh, surrogate species that are not in trouble at all and really creating those first experimental uh, programs for that. There were the, I'm actually in the middle of receiving some of that data back right now, so I can't fully speak to all those potential impacts. And honestly, there's probably a, another three years of research that need to be done to fully understand what those impacts are. That is one of the factors we weigh, is, is, that, is those external risks. Um, we also then wanted to weigh internal habitat quality. 
um, and then the size of the prairie you mentioned. Uh, so we actually, when we were selecting our reintroduction sites, went through quite a very intensive uh, planning process, multiple 60 to 50 page documents that we produced that, that force, you, uh, force us to think about those sorts of questions. And not only biological, but economic and logistical and socioeconomic, all those questions. Um, the goal though is long term to, is, is to come up with that, that tool, the, the toolkit, that recipe book to understand what are the actual conditions needed to provide sustainable uh, populations for them. We, most of the prairies we were working in are on the order of about a thousand acres. And that's on the larger end of, of the prairie extent that remains in the state of Minnesota in terms of remnant untouched prairie. A thousand acres? About a thousand acres, yeah. That's large. Yeah, so many of the fragments are, of course, smaller. That's right. No, they are. Um, and so we want to try to mitigate as much of that through um, and uh, select those first areas, or those larger areas first, and hopefully we can understand. Through all that, then we can hopefully understand what are conditions needed for restorations of prairies and what might be the sort of management tools that we need to, uh, that we can then hopefully not just get those dots back on the map in the first place, but then connect those dots. That's ultimately the long-term need. We want to figure out how do we restore those and recover those species so we can get them off the endangered species list. So, so Representative folks are, I could follow up, Mr. Chair? Representative Wagenius. So when folks are um, doing restorations in small, very small areas, um, prairie restorations, um, do we, <laughs> Do we have any idea of what guidance to give people at this point uh, when you don't want to have something next door that is going to be bad for the pollinators that you're trying to attract? I mean, I have heard someone call them death traps. I don't know who that would be, but I have heard somebody call them that. Um, how do we avoid that? Dr. Rehnquist. Uh, Representative, that's a very good question. Um, and I think we don't have all the answers in, in terms of what is really needed because that's also going to vary across our pollinators. The, that's, pollinators is like saying mammals or carnivores. It's, a, you know, it's an enormous group and there's tremendous amount of diversity there. And each species is going to have a, a different set of resources and needs. They're going to be moving around at different distances. So for example, the, the butterflies, the Dakota skippers that we've been tracking, the, we see them moving around within an area about 300 meters. Once they find a good spot, they're perfectly happy in that area. Um, and we're not really finding them moving out of there. And so those are the sort of focal points we want to understand and, and promote. Um, I think you're right, we, we definitely want to avoid those scenarios where um, there's a net negative on the population. and there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that front. It's a good question. So if I could follow up. Representative Wagenius, and Representative Wagenius, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. So <coughs> there are folks in my community that would like to do a lot of restoration, and I'm, I'm city. Mm. Um, they worry about the same issues. Um, but we don't need some of the same stressors that are prevalent in, um, in the farm community. So is there a potential for actually having good spots for pollinators in urban areas or suburban areas? Because I have both and folks who are interested in both urban and suburban. <laughs> Dr. Rehnquist. Chair Representative, yeah, of course. I think small actions can go a long way. Uh, and I think we can, we've demonstrated that with, with the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. There are populations that are known throughout the metro for these. And even if you're not being able to attract Rusty Patch Bumblebees or other <laughs> endangered species, we're losing a lot of pollinators. And that's a, 
tremendous amount of uh, food source for one of every three bites of food you take is, is owed to a pollinator in some way. And very small actions, um, even putting out a little five by five little piece of plot of land or just a single potted flower in the back of your yard, that's gonna be important food for that pollinator that, that needs it at that time. And uh, I think there are a large number of very good initiatives um, at the small scale and then at the large scale as well that, that can be done. Um, and I, I commend the, the state agencies that are working on those, such as Bowser and DNR and, and others. So, Representative question. Does, do you, Bowser and DNR, um, have resources for just Minnesotans who would like to do those smaller patches mm -hmm. of restoration, uh, particularly, I mean, I, I I won't tell you what's in my front yard right now, but it's definitely some bee balm. Uh, and I have all sorts of critters coming there, and it's small, yeah. I'm a city, yeah. a city dweller. So are there resources to help folks here? Sure, yes, yeah, so of course. Well, so the Minnesota Zoo has developed the Plant for Pollinator webpage, and the, the pamphlet you have in front of you is a condensation of that, uh, the green one. Um, and there is, uh, we also have been distributing seed packets throughout uh, at the zoo for the last several years of Minnesota sourced, uh, very thoroughly, thoroughly vetted uh, native plants. Um, free to guests for the last several years, and we hope to continue that into the future. And using the educational resources and tools at, on zoo grounds as, as one of those key contact points. In fact, we're going to be emphasizing pollinators as a key conservation action and message during our upcoming Farm Babies event in the spring. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Dr. Rehnquist, do you have these brochures available for members if they wanted them for town meetings or for their libraries or can you supply them in bulk? Yeah, Ch Chair, we have thousands and we also have them in Spanish as well. And so feel free, please contact us. We have, they are sitting in a shelf that they need to be distributed. Um, we have more than enough. So please, I encourage um, distribution. Representative Wagenius. Well, the final thing, the um, Monarch Festival that he talked about is actually held in my district uh, by Lake Nokomis. And it is an amazing festival. I have never been at a community event where there is such a diversity of citizens, little kids, big kids, older kids, <laughs> lots of kids. And uh, replicating that is probably a good idea. Um, I, you cannot park near Lake Nokomis on the day of the Monarch Festival. You have to have on your walking shoes and plan to walk four or five blocks to get there. It is that popular. And you have to be very careful not to be run over by kids in strollers. <laughs> it is that popular. Dr. Rehnquist and uh, Mr. Frawley, it seems, uh, you know, with that the zoo is a resource for folks, both in providing science but also providing education. Um, and I think one of the things we want to do, uh, we are, we're having drafted uh, some legislation to do uh, essentially what Representative Wagenius was talking about, try to incentivize uh, a small patch uh, pollinator habitat and I would ask if you could review it, not to endorse it, but to make sure it's scientifically sound. Uh, that would be helpful uh, in, before we bring it uh, to committee. And also it just seems that we have a very diverse state and that diversity is strength. And whether it's diversity in habitat or uh, diversity in ideas or approaches or in people, uh, that is a strength for our state. And um, I would hate if, if we've gone through all this effort to reintroduce uh, some iconic microfauna, would that be right, or charismatic, iconic microfauna, um, and then they were wiped out by drift uh, from pesticides or uh, the habitat disappeared uh, overnight. So I think we, and I understand the risk of 
sometimes uh, providing too much information of where things are could could lead to risk for those species. But it's something you know. I I think a couple of those photos were from National Geographic. That your work is known worldwide, and uh, we want to continue that. Work. <coughs> we want you to continue that work, and how we can support that because um, we're all part of this web of life, whether it's little or big. Some of us are bigger than others, but uh, if, if we can <clears throat> help on this, I think it's something we need to do. So um, if you have any final comments or questions, I don't know if, if any members have any other questions. Representative Fabian. Well, it's not a question. If he wants to respond to you first, then I've got uh, comments for um, Mr. Frawley. Okay. Well, thank, uh, I appreciate your support, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Frawley, thanks for the good work you do at the zoo. It's a terrific asset to the state of Minnesota, and I appreciate having had the opportunity to work with you in the past, and I look forward to it. I really do want to make sure that the committee knows the work that you're doing, and you touched on it briefly about finding corporate sponsors for different things, and you and I have had this conversation for some time, and I applaud you on that. Uh, your willingness to... Uh, kind of venture away, I'll say, from some sort of traditional funding to make the zoo even more vibrant and more attractive to more people. I just, I can't thank you enough for that. There's one other agency that uh, has, uh, this committee has purview over. I wish would adapt uh, some of your uh, uh, management styles, but uh, we'll have that conversation later, but thank you. And if you could maybe expand just a little bit more on your corporate sponsorships and how you go about encouraging them to do those things that you talked about. Mr. Frawley. Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, thank you for uh, that comment and, uh, and thank you for the question. It's critical. That's part of the fabric of Minnesota. We have a strong corporate environment here. Uh, they care about Minnesota. They care about everything that we're working on. They care about our mission. So, yeah, we've made a, a strong focus to really understand the needs of corporate Minnesota, and we align in so many different ways. So when we go to corporate Minnesota, uh, our strategy is first, you know, in the past, in the zoo would go to corporate Minnesota and say, do you want to sponsor a bear exhibit or, or something to that effect? And, you know, we said to our staff, you know, that's not what's happening in corporate Minnesota's boardrooms. They're not sitting there going, we should sponsor a bear exhibit at the Minnesota Zoo. What they're talking about is how to separate their brand, how to make their brand stronger. So the first thing we do is we go and we ask them, how can the Minnesota Zoo, how can our mission uh, strengthen your brand? Um, the second thing we ask them is, how can we retain, engage, and inspire your employees? Because corporate Minnesota, recruiting people to Minnesota, holding people in Minnesota is critical to their business strategies. Um, a lot of people in the workforce right now want to get outside. They want to participate in conservation efforts. They want to do something uh, to make their work more meaningful. Minnesota Zoo has these types of opportunities. So we ask them, you know, how can we help with your employees and retaining and inspiring your employees? Thirdly, we say to the corporate Minnesota, you know, some of your products are, it's hard for them to be sustainable. If you're an airline and you're flying jets, you know, that fuel is gonna be hard for the environment and it's tough uh, to counter that and, be, and, and find a sustainable approach. But we can help offset organizations impact on the environment and everybody should be looking for those offsets and how to make their own organizations more sustainable. So th these are the conversations we're starting to have with Minnesota, and it's going extremely well. Uh, Minnesota Zoo is a very strong, respe respected brand, and we need, to get, we need to open up those corporate doors um, because we do align in many ways. So this has been a strong strategy. In the end, the fourth, the fourth um, uh, you know, strategy that we give our, to our corporate partners is we thank them, uh, usually through a video or organically. Uh, because that's something that they need. They need an a, a, um, organic um, endorsement to say that this is a company in Minnesota that cares about the environment, that cares about animals, that cares about education, um, and that's part of the fabric of Minnesota. So it's been very successful for us. We, it's, a, it's a priority for us. Um, we know we can't just rely on just the state. We need to make this um, you know, a, a comprehensive strategy of how we run this zoo. So it's going well. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you and all of the staff who work at the zoo for the work you do for the people of Minnesota. And that includes the, uh, the finned and the feathered and the fuzzy and the scaly staff. 
<laughs> as well. So thank you for uh, bringing the Zoomobile here and hearing about this. We look forward to working with you uh, in the future. Um, just a little roadmap, uh, folks, for the next couple of meetings. Uh, next Tuesday, we will be hearing uh, nothing as exciting as, uh, as the porcupine uh, on Tuesday, but uh, we'll be hearing a little bit about the impacts of uh, the federal shutdown on agencies, and I think uh, we may hear from the zoo as well a little bit on impacts there. Uh, and then on Thursday next week, uh, we'll be talking about the closed landfill program uh, the MLCAP <coughs> program and landfills a little bit in general. So that's the roadmap for next week. Uh, the materials will be posted on the website. And uh, with that, the meeting is adjourned.